Hi everyone, welcome back to Coffee with Dr. A. Today, we're continuing our discussion on making the shift to online education. Specifically, how to engage students and how to develop better Zoom interactions. Thanks for being here. My name is Dr. Abdullah al -Gharani. I'm an Associate Professor of Economics at Northern Kentucky University, and I am the Director of the Center for Economic Education. Over the past year, I've taken on this challenge of making uh, virtual learning as engaging as in-person education. My colleague Rebecca Morrow and I have been hosting workshops with teaching and learning centers uh, across the country. And some of the tips I discuss here are part of our evolving list of tips for virtual learning with students in mind. So make sure to grab a cup of coffee and uh, let's talk about engaging students and developing connections in online teaching. I want to tell you about five tips that will help you engage your students in an online course. First tip that I have is to set the intention. The screen of fear is what I call the visual display when you are signed into Zoom and students are there, but all you see is empty black boxes with muted microphones. You say hi, good morning, and you hear nothing in response. It is one of the most uncomfortable feelings to experience. You can actually avoid it if you spend some time early on setting expectations and intentions. Some educators require that the cameras be on for class, and if you choose that approach, that's fine. For me, I realize that our new setup blurs the lines between work and life, so students are now having class in their private spaces. So it's important to allow for privacy concerns, but also clearly express that the intention is to have the camera on when possible. What has worked for me is leveraging what Brene Brown calls leading with vulnerability. It is important to include students in your intentions and tell them why keeping the camera on is important to you. Share that vulnerability of why you as an educator would benefit from having the camera on and acknowledge their privacy concerns. In doing so, you're recognizing their needs, but also sharing what your needs are. So here's what I do to set the intentions and to share vulnerability and respect their privacy. I say this mantra at the beginning of the semester and I repeat it from time to time. I say something along the lines of, hi everybody, I'm really excited to be here today. I love this class. One thing that I would really love is to develop engagement and, op and then the opportunity for us to connect. It would help me be a better educator if you had your cameras on. This way, I would put a face with your voice and I can actually see you. I also recognize that for some of us, turning the camera might not be possible and I respect your privacy. If you're able to turn on your camera, I would really appreciate that. What ends up happening is cameras go on because students need to know why it's important. In this case, it helps build connections and assists me in being a better educator, which ultimately benefits the students. As cameras pop on, thank the students. Set the intention so you can eliminate the screen of fear. Tip number two, avoid PowerPoint as a security blanket. A common response to the screen of fear is to use PowerPoint slides to ease the presenter. When you see all those black boxes while you have your camera on, it feels like you are at center stage and you feel responsible for finding a solution. The quickest response is to fill that space with not you. So you turn the PowerPoint presentation on. We want a visual to direct the attention to, so the slides are a security blanket. Allowing this to hide, you end up hiding everybody in the margins of Zoom. This actually reinforces the lack of engagement and communicates to your audience that you will fill the void whether they engage or not. In effort to make, more, make it more comfortable for yourself, you create less engagement, which is the opposite of your goal. Try this. Stay away from PowerPoint or sharing a screen for the first five minutes of class. Talk with the students. An easy tip here to implement is to ask students questions and have them 
answer <clears throat> using the reaction buttons in Zoom, or just ask a question and wait for them to respond. All right, tip number three, use time before class wisely. When I taught in person, I always showed up to the class 15 minutes before. I would quickly set up my technology, then I would walk around the room having conversations with students. I asked students about their life, their courses, the organizations they are part of on campus. It allows me to get to know them. I talk about the importance of this approach in uh, developing a sense of belonging in my working paper on classroom management and student interaction interventions, which I will link for you in the description below. Believe it or not, you can do the same thing in a virtual setting. In online classes, I show up to all my online classes 15 minutes before, and I tell students I'm going to show up 15 minutes before the actual start of class. Guess what? Students show up. I use the audio share function and have background music. Students are always interested in what songs I will play. They end up requesting their own songs and it starts a dialogue. When class starts at 9.25, I get started with class. Avoid the soft start to class where you wait for everyone to show up. You wouldn't do that in person, but I find virtual classes and meetings are susceptible to this issue. Meetings uh, usually start five minutes or so after they are scheduled to start. Be respectful of the time of those that respect your time and don't reward undesirable behavior. They will show up on time next class. Same thing with ending class, end at the designated time, but hang around for those that might want to ask questions after class. My class ends at 10.40 a.m. At 10.39 a.m., I tell students that the class is done. If anyone has questions or wants to continue the conversation, I'll be around till 10.50 a.m. Some students do hang out for a bit. Tip number four, use names. One of the benefits of virtual classes is everybody shows up with their name on the screen. I'll admit, one of my biggest struggles in life is remembering names. I'll remember your life story, I'll remember your experiences, I'll remember your grades, I'll remember everything about you. But for some reason, remembering names is difficult for me. Zoom makes it easy because everyone shows up with their first and last name on the screen. If your students are using uh, their user IDs, encourage them to change their names and also encourage them to put up a profile picture of themselves if they choose to keep their cameras off. So you know the face and you can make that connection. Actually, I have another bonus tip for you after this one. For tip number five though, it is to use chat functions to engage. I love the chat function. I do workshops across institutions about the transition to online education. The one tip that always resonates and gets some aha moments is this discussion on using the chat. I call it the 60 second rule. This is how it works. Ask students a question, instruct them to type it up in the chat and make sure they don't press enter until you say it is time to do so. Take up all 60 seconds. After 60 seconds are over, on the count of three, have them respond by pressing enter all at once. One thing that I will tell you is 60 seconds is going to feel like a long time, but don't cheat them out of those 60 seconds. You'll see the chat come alive as students hit enter. The reason I love this is because it levels the playing field in online classes in two ways. One, it allows students time to respond without feeling a sense of urgency. And the second reason is it minimizes the bias that is introduced by quick responders. Personally, I don't type fast. I can't express myself quickly in the chat function. And sometimes when conversations are going and people are taking over the conversation in chat, it forces me to step back. I am sure some students may feel the same way. The 60 second rule levels the engagement opportunity for all students. Once they all press enter at the same time, you will actually start to see their eyes shift to the chat. Everybody wants to know what everybody else is saying. Allow them that time. Let them live through that moment, figuring out what their other classmates are saying. But more importantly, you as an educator now have, re have responses from more students. You could go back and read the questions and responses to the chat to identify common themes that come up in that conversation. 
Obviously, there are many more ways to engage your students in an online setting. It requires effort and pushing through those initial uncomfortable moments. So here's the bonus tip. Create videos with students in mind. The biggest mistake by far that I see is faculty posting a 65 minute video to replace the in-person lecture. As I said in my last video about course design, fatigue kicks in at a faster rate in the online setting. Attention spans are shorter uh, when you're alone, just looking at a screen and there's no commitment strategy with other people involved. Keep that in mind and keep your videos to five to 10 minutes. I know it's a challenge because I even have a couple of 14 minute videos. Designing your videos this way will allow you to rethink the concepts you are teaching and how to explain them in a more concise way. This challenge will make you a better educator and allow your students to understand you better. When creating videos, try to include your image in the video. Even when you're talking over PowerPoint, there are so many programs that will allow you to do that. I'll link to some of them here in the video description. Uh, you can do it in Zoom, OBS, Ecamm, or any other program that your institution has a license to. Seeing you while you explain content brings that content to life and allows you to continuously connect with your students. Education is about relationships. The more engagement and connections we create between students, educators, and administrators, the better. I started off this uh, series with a question. Does online education work? To end it with an answer, online education can be leveraged to be a very powerful tool, but we really have to think about the things that we're doing and reevaluate them. And we have to shift away from the habits that we developed during in-person education and modify them for online environments. I truly believe the future is in online education. I see a lot of my friends and myself as well consuming online educational content. As lifelong learners, we recognize that with online education, there's a lot more information available to us. It is our duty as educators to prepare our students for the economy that they will walk into, not the economy that we, the educators, grew up in, and not the educational setting that we grew up in. We must prepare them for the workforce that they will navigate in and for the online communication, online meetings, online learning, online teaching that is part of now and our future. More businesses will be moving to virtual workforce and our graduates will be expected to work in this environment. I encourage us to incorporate online education and prepare our students. We need to push through this initial discomfort of trying something new. Thank you for following me on this quick journey through my transition to online education and for listening to my thoughts. I'm working on a new series, some new exciting content, but I always want to hear from you. Is there something you want to learn more about? Comment below, tell me the one thing you want to learn more about. Thank you for your support and for building our community. I appreciate you. See you next week on Coffee with Dr. A.